is Victor Morales, and um, uh, we we just uh, uh, been coming to Hope Church for about two years. January third, we uh, were sitting at home at eleven thirty at night, uh, just relaxing, watching movies, playing on our phones like typical families. Um, when we got the call that our nineteen-year-old Caleb had been rushed to the emergency room at Spartanburg Regional, had been in a single vehicle car accident. He was the driver. And at one o'clock in the morning, they pronounced him uh, as graduated to heaven. (laughs) Hard. It was hard, it was hard, it was hard. We were waiting and we were praying and, you know, and um, I don't even feel like I was willing to, uh, until she started speaking, I was expecting to hear something different than the news that we got. Yeah. The pastor was talking this morning about the broken heart and how you can kind of have a heart attack from that. And I, I kind of question whether or not I did that week because my heart hurt really bad that week, like a pain I've never felt in my entire life. Um, of all the things we've been through, and we've been through a lot, this has been like the hardest um but jesus and but god and but the comforter of the holy spirit because um god showed up real big over the course of the next month even uh, and still shows up big i understand i can so relate to the disciples you know when jesus said do you want to leave too? You know, after he preached a hard word and, and, and a lot of his disciples didn't walk with him any longer and he turned to his disciples and said, do you guys want to go too? And, and Paul looks, um, I'm sorry, Peter looks at him and says, where would I go? No one else has the words of eternal life. That's our, I think, I can say that's our perspective. There, we've, There's nowhere else to go. Jesus is everything. I can't imagine what it's like for people who don't know the Lord to have to walk through this kind of grief. Um, I wouldn't be able to do it if I didn't have the Lord. Um, It would be near impossible, if not impossible. And so, but with God, all things are possible. We don't sorrow as the world sorrows. Mm -mm. Our sorrow is in hope. And yeah. I, I've told her I'm changing my, um, the way I speak about him. He's not dead. He's transitioned. He's gone from, from yep. one place to another because we, we, we grieve in hope, knowing that someday we will be together again and we'll know him in a different Amen. way. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, nobody can touch our hearts. Nobody can strengthen us. Nobody can give us eternal perspective. No one can love us. No one can impart hope. Nobody can encourage us the way that you can. So, Father, right now, Lord, not only do we continue to lift up Victor and Alicia and their family, God, all those, Lord, who've recently had loved ones to go on, Lord, to be with you. God, I pray that they would feel your presence, number one, that they would feel your loving embrace. Father, that they would know that they're still complete in you. Even though their heart hurts, even though there's a deep sense of loss and a void, Lord, God, let them find their footing in you. Help them to always remember you're a covenant-keeping, faithful God. And Lord, we know where our loved ones are. Lord, whatever hurt right now, would you minister healing and strength? Would you encourage whatever battles, Lord, people are in? Father, would you come along beside? Lord, would you bring believers, God, Lord, I know Victor and Alicia have said so many times, Lord, that they they were just blown away by the love of their church family, Lord. God, send us all, God, 
to lift up somebody's arms. Lord, when our arms need lifting up, send people to lift our arms up too, Lord. And Lord, we'll always give you the glory and the praise in Christ's name. Everybody said, amen. All right. Well, I've got a word, and I'm excited about it. Before we jump into that, look, let me encourage you with something. You know, this uh, big baptistry here, we're going to do the water baptism next service. Let me tell you, it is not just something symbolic. Water baptism, if you want to read, you can read, uh, uh, I'm not going to take time and read it, but Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 11 and 12, it talks about what it is. Water baptism is a circumcision. Every covenant had to be ratified in some way. This is the ratification. When something is ratified, this is the sealing of the new covenant. Now, if you prayed to receive Christ, but you said, ah, I, I just never have seen sense in this. Can I tell you, after being in ministry for nearly 40 years, people who struggle with the assurance of their salvation if you ask them questions and you dig back it's usually because they were not scripturally water baptized and that was not ratified within them i cannot it doesn't save you but it seals you and here's another thing it brings a ratification and assurance of your salvation another thing it does is it cuts away the flesh it cuts away that old sin nature all those things that tend to pop up in our life that we struggle with so who wouldn't want those, okay? Who, who doesn't need those things? Uh, I, I'm one that I found myself later in, my, in, in life after I was even pastoring. I, I didn't feel like there were some things that I had received when I was water baptized. So I went and I did, I did it again. And I'm going to tell you, I am so glad I did because God gave me an assurance. But mainly, he cut some stuff out of my past that really needed to be circumcised and removed. So... I don't know who I'm talking to, but I believe I'm talking to somebody. We've got clothes. If you need to stay, um, you can stay uh, and, and take part in the water baptism next service. So, We're in a series called Finished, Not Final. So let me encourage you. When you feel like it's finished, can I tell you this? It's not. It's not over. It's not finished. Why? Because God is always ahead of you. And God is always working things out for the good. He's working things out on our behalf. God is using this pandemic. And I know we're all so over it. We're all so tired of it. But I believe he's using it to do a couple of things. Number one, to help us to get our eyes on Jesus and keep our eyes on the Lord. And also to sink our roots down deep into death deepen our faith, to deepen our resolve, to deepen our commitment, and to tie us and root and ground us into those things that are eternal, things that will never change because so much has changed in the last year that we've got to be anchored and rooted and grounded in the things that don't change. I believe, though, we're turning the corner. I believe it's time that I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying this. It's time to step into your next. I think we've hit, uh, people have hit pause way too long. Step into your next. Next, launch out, advance. That's what we're doing tonight as a church family. We're going to begin interest socials for our Greenville campus. It will be our, our third campus. So that's what we're doing corporately. But let me ask you, what do you need to do personally? What is your next? What is it that the Spirit of God has been stirring you and prompting you to step out into? I don't know what that is, but you know what? I believe you know what that is. What is God calling you to move towards in faith? That you have not, you've thought about it, you've prayed about it, you've dreamed about it, but you've not moved towards that thing. What is it that you are supposed to step into? Step out of where you are, step into that next, okay? Step in because God's got good things for you. Today we're going to look at the life of Simon Peter. We'll see some characteristics that I'm going to highlight out of his life that I believe God wants us to have. So take your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. <clears throat> took me a while to figure this out. Now, in the Gospels, the 12 are called the disciples. Disciple means a learner. 
They're disciplined. They have to be disciplined. They need to learn. They need to be shaped and molded. In Acts, you'll notice that they're not called disciples anymore. Why? Because Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected. He's in heaven, so he's left it with them. They're called apostles after that. They're called messengers. They were sent to take his place and to be messengers. So let's read this in Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One day... Soon after Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, he prayed to God all night. You know, before every major decision or event in his life, Jesus prayed. That'd be a good thing for us to do, wouldn't it? Verse 13, at daybreak, Jesus called all of his disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, whom he named Peter. Andrew, Peter's brother. James and John, they were brothers. Philip. Bartholomew, if you're looking for a good name, that's a good one for your kid. Bartholomew, all right. Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed Jesus. You see, the apostles were not always called by the same name. That's confusing to me, I don't know, but... Uh, I always try to keep things pretty pretty simple. And l let me help clarify that. Simon, why did he give him a nickname Peter? Well, because there was another Simon, right? Uh, and he didn't want to confuse them. He didn't want them to get confused when he said their names. Uh, he called Simon uh, Barjona, he called him Peter. He's also called Cephas. Why is he called Cephas? Cephas is Aramaic. The Bible was written in Greek. They spoke Aramaic. They knew uh, a lot of them knew Latin. They knew several languages, pretty educated people. We think they were just common, uneducated people. But uh, it was just they spoke multiple languages there. Matthew was also called Levi. Bartholomew, that was hard to say, he was called Nathaniel. Judas, son of James, is also called Thaddeus. So uh, hopefully that helps clear up some of the, wow, why so many? I thought I didn't know he was one of the 12. I remember one time years ago, I started adding up all the names, and I came up, what, 15 or 16. I thought it was, it was just 12. But they, had, they were called by, by different names, kind of like nicknames. But here's the point. Jesus chose ordinary people with different personalities and different backgrounds. There was two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew. James and John, all four were commercial fishermen. They were all for Capernaum. They, they, with their families, had a commercial fishing venture. They knew each other. Remember uh, with the story in Luke where uh, he, Jesus tells Peter to cast out on the other side of the boat to launch out into the deep, and he got this big thing. He called his partners. That's who he was calling. Okay, the rest of their family that were fishermen and James and John and them. And that's how they get woven. So all four of them were really tight. They knew each other before this. Jesus also called Matthew a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated. They were outcast. That tells me this. Jesus didn't just look for the most popular people. Aren't you glad of that? He didn't look for, the, uh, for just the the ones voted most likely to succeed. Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were an outlaw political party, and they were continually trying to overthrow the Roman rule in Israel. So, again, he goes on the fringes and pulls people in. But, you know, God still does that. He goes on the fringes, and he pulls people in. God still calls ordinary people to build his church, to love, and to serve God others we're to love and serve listen with all the tension all the stuff racially uh with we're, we're to love and serve blacks whites slavics asians hispanics we're to love and serve the the poor and the rich the educated and the uneducated we're to love and serve democrats and republicans those who wear masks and those who won't wear masks Listen, I'm trying to help myself, and I'm trying to help all of us, okay? What he's saying that when we're Christ-like, we love and serve without prejudice, without being predisposed towards certain people. We're to love and serve those who got the vaccine and those who would never get the vaccine, right? Come on. And not look down on anybody because God didn't look down 
of us. You know, Simon, let's get back to him. It's a common name. There are at least seven Simons in the Gospels. I told you you can get confusing with all their names. Uh, two of the 12 apostles were Simon, Simon Peter and Simon the Zealot. There's also Simon the Pharisee. There's Simon the leper. That was a popular name, real common, wasn't it? There was Simon. Jesus had a half-brother named Simon. Simon of Cyrene, you remember him? When Jesus couldn't carry the cross anymore, he stepped in, and he, he, was, a, he was a black Simon from northern Africa, and he helped carry the cross. Simon uh, was Judas Iscariot's father's name. But our Simon, his full name was Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar means son of Jonah. And uh, it means unstable, like a reed in the wind. Unstable, undependable, easily swayed, easily brought, blown to or fro. That's his name. That's what Simon means. History even tells us, to make that worse, his father was now, had the reputation of being an alcoholic. Okay? So those who've grown up with an alcoholic uh, parent or in an addictive family, then you know the instability of that. It was in his very DNA, in his very nature. But Jesus gave him the nickname Peter, Petra, Rock. Why? Because Jesus is speaking something into him. He's saying, listen, you have a reputation, your family, for being unstable, for being easily swayed, undependable. But I'm saying you're going to be strong. You're going to be stable. You're going to be dependable. And I'm going to make and mold you into that. Let's read about it. Matthew 13, verse, I mean, Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Like, he's saying, who do people out there? What's, what's being said about me in the streets? What are people, what's the gossip? What are people saying about me? Verse 14, well, they replied, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then Jesus asked them, he brought it home, who do you say that I am? See, everybody spoke up with all those other answers, but nobody spoke up. Who do you say that I am? And we know the one that always speaks up. Simon Peter answered, and he said, you're the Messiah the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together and thank him? Amen. Thank you, Lord. I believe, and what we're going to look at today is, is we go through this story and we look at snippets of Simon Peter's life. We're going to see some characteristics of how he took that which was easily swayed and vacillating and unstable and undependable and made it strong and stable. You know what? We've all got those things in our life, too that the Lord wants to put his hand on, that he wants to use, He wants to stabilize, he wants to strengthen in his life so he can use us and he can build upon us. Jesus said, you're Simon, but I'm changing you. You're going to become Peter. You're going to become a rock. You're going to be stable. You're going to be dependable, and I'm going to build on you. Can I tell you this, folks? Just like with Peter, your past and your family do not matter. Do you hear that? Your past does not matter. What family you came from does not matter. What your dad, your mom, what, your, what they were like does not matter to God. What other people say about you, what other people think about you does not matter. Praise God. What matters is what God says about us. And what matters is what we say and think about ourselves. That's what matters. What other people or our background, our past, it doesn't matter with God. What matters is what God's saying. That's why we got to get in the Word. That's why we got to get with God. That's why we have to walk with the Lord and hear what He says about us and what we think and what we say about ourselves. Jesus gave Simon the nickname Peter to remind him of who God said He was because God was going to use him greatly. You know, sometimes after He kind of gave him the nickname Peter, uh, Jesus would still refer to him as Simon. And we're going to see a couple of times of that. Well, he called him sometimes Peter, and then he called him Simon. 
Why would he call him Simon sometimes? Because he called him Simon. You can just, you can look this as you read the Gospels. He called him Simon when he was acting like a reed that was easily swayed in the wind. When he was unstable, when he was reverting back to his old nature, his old self, he would call him Simon. And, and I'm sure that Simon heard that. Peter heard that too much, and I'm sure he kind of cringed on the inside and said, Jesus, you gave me the name Peter. Come on, call me Rock. I like my nickname. I like my I like to be I like it when you call me Rock. And I believe Jesus thought this. I'll call you Rock when you act like a rock. And I'm gonna call you Simon when you act like a Simon. But you know what? God always invites us to be more than we are, to be greater than we are. See, he always invites us into a future, and our future is good in God. Let's read Luke 22, verse 31. Jesus is speaking. He says, Simon, Simon. It's bad now because he repeats it twice. All right, Simon, Simon. Satan is asked to sift not just you, but each. Mark that. I marked it in my Bible. Each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded for you in prayer. Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and returned to me again, strengthen your brothers. See, I believe Jesus is praying that same prayer for us. Why? Because Satan wants to sift us too. Satan comes like a roaring lion looking, looking for some place to gain entrance into all of our lives and Jesus is praying for us. He's praying. What's he praying? He's praying that our faith wouldn't fail. He's praying that. So we need to make sure that we keep our faith strong. And if you failed, you know what? He's praying that you'd repent, that you'd come back to him, that you would return to him. And then he's praying that when we learn those hard lessons of life, that we won't be prideful, that we'll actually turn that around and we'll share that and we'll strengthen others with those lessons we've learned. Now, we all know that Peter failed. He denied Jesus three times. He denied knowing him three times. But let's see how Jesus restored him. John 21, verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord Peter replied, you know that I love you, then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Jesus said, I mean, Peter said, you know that I love you, then take care of my sheep. Jesus said, verse 17, the third time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. That Jesus asked him the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then go feed my sheep. You see, what was Jesus doing? He was undoing what Peter had done. He's got a way of doing that for us too. When we mess up, he can untangle it. Right? When we get it all jumbled and messed up, he comes in here. Three times Peter denied knowing Jesus. So three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And he said the first time, do you love me more than these? I'm sure he was pointing at all the other disciples around. Why? Because Peter said, though they all stumble, I won't stumble. Well, he did. We better be careful the words we speak, right? But Jesus, it was a kind of a healing on the inside. And he was lifting and he was breaking the memories and the hurt and the trauma on the inside. You know, there's an outer healing, but there's an inner healing too. And that's what Jesus was doing here. And he had him affirm his love three times. You know what? That was the last time Jesus ever referred to him as Simon. All the rest of the way through the Gospels. He calls him Peter, Rock, Petra. I'm going to build on you. A few weeks after this, 
on Pentecost Sunday, Peter and the 120 disciples were in that upper room when the Holy Spirit fell and they were all baptized with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with tongues. They were confused what's happening. They didn't understand that. But it was Peter. It was the rock who stood up and brought clarity. He clarified the experience through the language of reaching back into the prophet Joel and what Joel had prophesied. He says, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Listen, it was Peter who stood up, who stood to the forefront. It wasn't Simon, it was Peter, the rock, the strong, the stable one, the dependable one. You see, all of us, we're like Peter. All of us have two sides to us, don't we? We got the carnal side and a spiritual side. I still revert back to my carnal side, my fleshly side sometimes. You know what? And when I do, I'm unstable. I'm unstable for myself, for my wife, for my family. I'm unstable for you. We, we, all, we all get pulled back to that. And you know what? God, he didn't write us off. He didn't cast us away. He speaks to us. He works with us. He believes in us. God never gives up on us, so let's don't ever give up on ourselves. Let's don't ever give up on others because he doesn't give up on us. We all have that time that we reach back into the old habits of the flesh. Y'all are just looking at me like, no, you're the only one, Tony. All right, come on. Are you with me? I know you. We all revert back to that sometimes. But you know what? We all have that spiritual side too. Where we lean in. We don't lean back to the old flesh. We lean into the spirit of God. To the Holy Spirit that lives in us. That makes us righteous. That makes us bold. That makes us strong. That makes us stable. And then God uses that. So I want to finish the time the next few minutes. And I want to give you. I want to highlight out of Peter's life. Five character qualities that Peter had. There, there, I could have found probably 10, 15, 20, but I, I'm, I'm going to do five. Real, I'm going to move real quick. I can't get in depth that, that Peter had, but I believe that God wants us, you and me, to have too. And if God can change Simon, the unstable one, into Peter, the rock, he can change you and me too. Here's the first character quality that makes us strong like a rock is initiative. Come on, say it. Initiative. Initiative. God wants you to take initiative. God wants you to be proactive. I, I, I encourage you. You look, listen, in the gospel, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Bible, God works with people who have a bias towards action. Now, if you're going to go to the bat all the time and you're going to stand up there and you're just going to keep that bat on your shoulder, God won't do much through your life. You got to swing the bat, darling. Okay? You may fail, sure, but you you know, we don't fail, we learn. We learn. So I want to encourage you start taking initiative. Some of you may have just real laid back uh, personalities, but look, this is something the Spirit of God wants to do in all of us. Peter asked more questions and he took more initiative than any of the other apostles did. He he said when Jesus talked about forgiveness, he's, what, what, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many times? Seven? How many times? I, I want to know. If you're going to ask, do you, you want me to tell me to forgive, how many times do I need to forgive somebody? Seven times? And he knew that look from Jesus. Oh, 70. Jesus said, seven times 70. You know, what is he saying? Just never stop forgiving because you're going to lose count by the time you get to 490, right? Just always be a forgiving person. P Peter's the one that said this, we've left everything, Lord, to follow you. What's going to be our reward for that? And Jesus told him, take initiative. It's okay to inquire of the Lord. Ask the Lord questions. I believe the Lord delights in that. He loves that. It proves and it shows him there's something stirring on the inside of us. Every follower of Jesus Christ should have some drive and some ambition. Not selfish ambition. I'm not talking, the God doesn't like that. But ambition for, for your family, ambition for your the kingdom of God, ambition to be all that you could be. Don't sit back and wait for things to happen. Remember this, without faith, without what works is dead. 
Sometimes you got to say, I'm going to make things happen. Sometimes I say, okay, Lord, I'm stepping into this situation. I'm going to make something happen and help me not to hurt myself or somebody else. Okay? But I'm just not sitting down here in all this pain. Something's going to change, bless God. I can't, we, you, this is not of you. Come on, it's, it's easy to discern what situations and circumstances are not of God. Okay, God, I'm going to do something, all right? If, if I go a little too far to the left, put your loving father, this is the way I talk with the Lord, put your loving fatherly hands on me and nudge me back the other way. If I go too far this way, put your hands on me and lovingly by your, by your father's heart and the, your spirit, nudge me in that right direction. But I'm going to move. I am not staying here. Like those lepers outside the city in the Old Testament. Why sit here till we die? I'm not going to stay long in pain. I'm not going to stay long in, in, in lack. I'm not going to stay long in an unhealthy situation. I'm going to let God begin to move me. Amen? Come on. Some of you need to get moving. All right. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus, without hesitation, Peter pulled out his sword and he just took a swack at somebody. Let's read about it. Luke 22. That, that's initiative, right? Jesus said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they, they saw all these Roman soldiers and, and all these religious Pharisees and Sadducees coming, and they knew, ah, oh, they're going to arrest Jesus. And, and, and when they saw what was about to happen, they, they exclaimed, they shouted, Lord, should we fight? We brought our swords. And one of them, it doesn't identify him in Luke, but it does in another gospel. It says, and Peter pulled out his sword and he struck the high priest's slave or his servant. His name was Malcolm. And he slashed off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And Jesus touched the man's ear, the servant's ear, and he healed him. See, what was Peter trying to do? He was trying to cut his head off. That's what he was trying to do. Now, he was a great fisherman. He was lousy with a sword, so he cut his ear off, all right? But I'm sure he was aiming for about right here, all right? And, and I don't know if the guy ducked like that and got his right ear. Shh, I, I'm not sure, okay? But nonetheless, Peter wasn't afraid to take initiative. That's why God used him. Now, are you hearing this? Some of you got to take some initiative. You've been sitting Suffering, simmering, thinking too long. Take initiative. Step out. Trust the Lord. His hand's on you. So with hundreds of highly trained Roman soldiers there, what's Peter thinking? Well, he probably wasn't thinking a lot. But here's the point. It's better to work with someone who is proactive and take initiative. I love people like that than it is to continually try to motivate people who don't want to do anything in life, who don't want to, uh, who are just passive and they're hesitant and they're, they're, they're just complacent and they really, they don't care. How do you get someone caring that doesn't care? So I think this is a, I'm, I'm spending more time on this and so I'm going to be quick with the rest. I think it's a big deal. God wants you to be a proactive person who takes initiative. Second, second character quality that makes us strong like a rock is involvement. You see, God wants you to get in the game. He wants you to get involved. He wants you to serve. He wants you to develop relationships with others. He wants you to, he wants you to give. He wants you to contribute. He wants you to grow. Uh, don't be content just to stay in the stands or stay on the sidelines. Listen, God didn't call you. God didn't save you to be a spectator. He saved you to put you in the game. That's why you got to have some initiative. All right? You got to step out, but you got to be involved. Jesus came to his disciples walking on water. Now, it was during, it wasn't a calm night. It was during a storm, a terrible storm on the Sea of Galilee. Guess who jumped out of the boat during the storm? Why? It was Peter. Why? Because he had initiative? Yeah, but something else too. He just wanted to be involved. He just wanted to get in on what Jesus was in on. And after he jumped out, he said, Lord, 
I think he began to sink immediately. doesn't say that, but Lord, command me to come to you because he knew enough that when Jesus spoke it, it was going to happen. And he says, Lord, command me to come to you. And Peter began to walk. We know later on he broke his focus on Jesus and he, he began to sink again. You know, don't be so hard on Peter. Be hard on the others. Where were they? In the safety of the boat, trembling with fear, thinking they're going to die, wetting their pants if they weren't already wet. I don't know. Get the point? Sometimes we're hardest on the people that we need to cut the most slack. At least they did something. You know, I'd rather I'd rather swing out. Uh, I, I would I would rather I would rather strike out swinging than get called out with the bat on my shoulder. And I think God would love that too. He really would. Be a person of initiative. Be a person that says I want to get involved. Third, character quality that makes us strong is submission. Submission is the willingness to give up our desires and preferences. That we say, I don't have to have my way. You know, that's good for your relationship with God. It's good for your relationship with your spouse, too. It's just good for you in life to learn this. You don't have to get your way all the time. It doesn't have to go the way you think it should all the time. Submission is honoring God by yielding to the authority that God releases into others. Strong Christians that are rock-like, all right? They tend to be confident. They tend to be aggressive. Sometimes they can even be dominant. But to balance this, we all must be tempered with submission. Submission to authority. Number four, the fourth character quality that makes us strong like a rock is discipline. Self-control and discipline, <laughs> man, uh, we don't talk enough about those but they don't come naturally to a lot of people or maybe to anybody. It's just against our human nature. Here's what I'll tell you. If you do not develop discipline, you'll never really be a disciple. You'll never make a good follower of Christ. Do you know that uh, the New Testament uses the word Christian twice? And it uses the word disciple 140, 150 sometimes. So God isn't looking for Christians. The world's full of Christians. Christians don't change the world. Disciples, sold out followers of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit of God. That's who changes the world. Christians don't change the world. Christians, listen, they're a dime a dozen. Churches are filled with Christians. It's not just believing something in the head. It's having a conviction enough to live by it and to stake your life on it, and to risk your life for it. The final thing, fifth thing, character quality that makes us strong like a rock is humility. Now, you wouldn't think these humility and submission, you wouldn't think, how does that make us strong? You see, most people that taste any kind of success in life, they are tempted by the sin of pride. Pride's just thinking too highly. Of yourself. Here's some clues of pride. Here's what I look for. Self-centeredness. People always want their way. Got to have it their way, all right? It'll kill a, it'll kill a, kill a marriage, kill a relationship, kill a church. It's, it's not about getting your way. It's about going God's way. People who always use words like I, me, my, instead of ours. I, I have, my personality, I abhor those words, I, me, my. Sometimes I'm talking to people that and, and a husband or a wife will say, yeah, my son, my, my, my daughter, my this, my that. And I'll say, did they have anything to do with it? Just yours? What, was that from another marriage or something? No, no, that's ours. I said, well, then maybe you should say ours, huh? We get so possessive. We get so possessive. See, it, it, it just shows that there's a self-centeredness that's got to be rooted out of all of us. Pastors that say, my church, no, it's not your church. You didn't die for them. You think it's your church? When you're dead, you'll see. It'll be somebody else's church, huh? No, it's Jesus' church, right? It's Jesus' church. 
just makes me cringe when I hear, or, or buy this, buy that. No, listen, we're all bought with the same price. We all have the same intrinsic value to God. Don't subjugate other people by calling names like you possess them. Honor the Lord in people. That's why we can love and serve black, Asian, Hispanic, Slavic, white, people like us, people not like us. Why? Because we learn to see God in them. And we learn to see past the outer shell and the skin. That's a real disciple. That's a real follower of Jesus Christ. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Jesus told the 12 disciples, he says, all of you are going to be made to stumble because of me. Peter revealed his pride, said, I'm never. I, I, they might, that's what he's thinking. They might, I see that Jesus is, I mean, Peter's thinking, but I will never be made to stumble. We know this, Jesus was right and Peter was wrong as always. Peter learned a lot through the school of hard knocks. You know what? We're all going to make mistakes. Is that right? Okay. If you're, not making a, if you're not making a lot of mistakes, you're not doing much. You're just not doing anything with your life if you're not making some mistakes. If you're afraid of making mistakes, the devil's got you right where he wants you to be because you're never stepping out in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. Now follow me. Just like Jesus taught Peter, shaped his life so much through the school of hard knocks, Jesus is attracted to our faith, but you know what? He's attracted to our failure. He's attracted to us when we blow it. And he'll come in there in his loving, gracious way, and he will shape our life so that we learn a lot through the school of our hard knocks too. I've got a wall full of diplomas. They're master's degrees in various subjects from the school of hard knocks, okay? If you're wise, you'll start framing your master's degrees from the school of hard knocks. Because God loves us so much, he never misses an opportunity to teach us, to shape us, to fashion and form us, to make us more like him, but to make us fit to love and serve others, to build and advance his church. And for people like that, I believe Jesus is saying over those of us who say, I'll be like that, Lord. I believe he's saying, I'll build on you too. And the gates of hell, all the powers of hell, won't be able to stop you because, listen, God is for you. Listen to what Peter wrote towards the end of his life. 1 Peter 5, 6, 5, 5, and 6. All of you dress yourselves in humility. Now, he was anything, he was, he was self-assured, cocky. He was arrogant to start with. Okay, and, and why, why, how can it be that and be unstable and undependable? Because a lot of people's cockiness and arrogance is a cover-up for their insecurity. That's all it is. That's all it is because they don't know who they are on the inside. They don't know who they are in God. Here's what he wrote as an old man. I like this because I guess I'm identifying with the old man. Huh? All of you dress yourselves in humility. Dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let me ask you, when you got dressed this morning, did you put on some humility? Do you know that you don't know it all? Do you know that you don't have all that it takes? to do even what God's called you to do. You need God. But you know what? Your success will still be limited with just God. God so designed us that we need him and we need one another. It's the family of God. Like it or not, you need me. 
I need you. We need one another. That's why he can say, make sure that every day you clothe yourself with humility. How do you get humility? Well, it's back to the school of hard knocks, isn't it? It shapes us like it did Peter. Well, let me fast forward to the end. How did Peter's life end? Well, we know that Jesus told him. He, he was asking uh, when, when he said some good things about John. Uh, again, they were family friends, both in the commercial fishing business. He said something about, uh, you know, one, one of you will, uh, will see me. But So Peter inquired. He was full of questions. He took initiative. And, and Jesus told him that uh, pretty much you're, you're going to die a martyr's death. Well, the Bible doesn't record Peter's death, but church history tells us that he was crucified. Not just Peter, but after the resurrection, some years later in the ascension, he left Jerusalem and he and his wife went all around as a tandem, husband and wife, preaching and ministry team. The persecution got so intense that they were both crucified. Peter was forced to see his wife crucified. What would you say to your wife? Here's what Jewish history records that Peter told his wife. Just remember the Lord. We all go through pain. Death of a child, death of a spouse, serious illness, bankruptcy, relationship that was the love of your life falls apart. I think what Peter told his wife is good for us today. Just remember the Lord. Just remember, never forget that God loves you. He is with you. He is for you. may not always deliver you out of what you want him to, but you will be his for all of eternity. Amen. Come on. Can we thank the Lord for that? <clears throat> After he saw his wife crucified, Peter, history tells us, began to plead. He said, they had the cross already up that he was going to be crucified on. And he pleaded with them, do not crucify me. For I am not worthy to die in a manner of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So they took that cross and they nailed him to it upside down. And that's how he died. You know what? I think that was fitting. Because Jesus turned his life upside down, which was right side up, really. Peter's wife, Peter, they didn't die as Christians. Christians, they bail out way before that. They died as disciples, wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Just lift your hands to the Lord. I want to pray for us. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who lives in us and is working in us, I pray, Father, by the Spirit's power, would you develop these character qualities that Peter had, that the other disciples had. Would you develop them in us today? God, this 21st century, God, we don't need any more Christians. We need disciples, wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. 
teach us, Lord, to take initiative. God, to get out of our comfort zone, to get out of our complacency, and to step out in faith. God, teach us, God, Lord, not to just stand on the sidelines and critique everything, but God, to get in the game, to get involved. Come on, pray for yourself. As I, to take initiative, get involved. Lord, help us to be submitted, Lord. Not, not our will, not our way, God, not our preference, but yours, your will, your way, Lord. God, your word, do it in our life, God. Help us, God, to be disciplined, God, to be self-control. Self-control is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that we would exhibit that fruit of the Spirit, God, that discipline, the boundaries, the guardrails would come to our lives, God, that we, Lord, would apply them to ourselves, that, God, we would let others apply them to us, Lord, willingly, God, without grumbling, without complaining, God, and that we would clothe ourselves every day with humility, Lord. Lord, because we know that you resist the proud, but you give more and more grace. God, we need grace, Lord. And Lord, we know your qualification for more and more grace is to embrace humility. We do all these things willingly, Lord, because we just ask that you would make us strong, you would make us stable, you would make us, God, rock like believers and disciples willing to go whatever, wherever, and do whatever, Lord, Father, and minister, God, to build and advance the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together and thank you? One moment before you go, just heads bowed. If you're here and you never have said yes to Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. The greatest miracle is for to open your heart and say yes to Jesus and let him come inside of you and make you into a new person. So right now with uh, heads bowed, no one's looking around but me, but if you never have said yes to him and you need to say yes, or maybe you've, you've said yes to him, but you've drifted far away and you need to come back to the Lord, would you just lift your hands? I want to pray. I want us to pray right now. Come on, don't be ashamed of him. If you're ashamed of him on earth, he said, I'll be, Jesus said, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. Don't be ashamed of him. Say yes. Thank you. Come on, can we pray this together and say, Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you died for my sin. I repent and I ask you to come into my life. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for hearing my prayer and thank you for making me a new person. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together one more time? The altar is going to be open the front here, and we're going to have our ministry team up here. They'll be here to pray for you. I love you. I bless you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Have a great week. God bless you.